Right. Welcome everyone to, uh, to this seventh talk in our summer colloquium, co-organized by Harvard and MIT Society of Physics students. My name is Tung. I am an undergrad, undergraduate studying physics at MIT and one of the organizers of our colloquium speaker series. I'm here today with our, my co-moderators, Mincho, Guan, and Task, and we are very honored to have Dr. Patty Lee from Continuum to speak with us today. If you have any questions at any time, you can raise your hand in the Zoom participant sidebar and we will call on you. Or you can privately send a message to me and I will ask for you. We will prioritize those who raise their hands in order to make our event feel as conversational as we can. In the spirit of keeping this a more relaxed and personal conversation, we also request that everyone be muted unless they are speaking and also have their video on if you're willing and able. Now, before starting the talk, let us briefly introduce today's speaker to you. Mincho. Uh, yes, we are extremely excited to have Dr. Patty Lee give a talk with us today. Uh, Dr. Lee is the Chief Scientist for Hardware Technology Development for Commercial Trapped Ion Quantum Computers at Continuum. She received her PhD at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor under supervision of Professor Chris Monroe, and she previously worked as an experimental physicist at National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is called as NIST, and US Army Research Laboratory. Dr. Lee and her team is pursuing scalable trapped ion technology and delivering commercial quantum computers with high fidelity operations and large quantum volumes. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for giving a talk at Shilokyo this week. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to speak. Um, let's see if I can share my screen here. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so feel free to uh, in, uh, uh, stop me and ask questions anytime. Uh, this is going to be a pretty um, relaxed and, and very informal. Um, so yeah, uh, today I'll tell you a little bit about uh, um, what we do at Quantinuum and uh, how we build high performance uh, trapped ion quantum computers um, and uh, and a little bit about my journey and how do we, we get there. Um, so, so many of you uh, might not have heard about Quantinuum um, or uh, maybe you wondered how to say its name. It's like Continuum, but with the quantum in front, so it's Quantinuum. Um, Quantinuum was formed a couple of years ago, uh, around uh, at the end of 2021, um, and it's actually a merger between uh, Honeywell Quantum Solutions, um, which has been building trapped ion quantum computing hardware, um, and uh, Cambridge Quantum Computing, which is a uh, software company um, in the UK. Um, that does quantum computing software. Um, so uh, right now we still have most of our hardware in uh, Colorado and Minnesota. Um, and then we have um, our uh, in colleagues internationally doing most of the software uh, development work uh, in uh, multiple sites in the UK, as well as uh, in Germany and Japan. Um, and so, um, you know, this is in the way we look at it is really we need uh, good hardware uh, for quantum computing, but we also need software and all these software development kits that allow uh, users to really efficiently write and uh, software and develop, you know, algorithms for quantum computer. Um, so this is kind of our full stack approach. Where you know I uh, typically work here down here with our H series quantum computer hardware, um, but we also have a uh, our software um, uh, divisions also have um, different products. Uh, a major one is this Ticket uh, software development kit um, that is open source and you can download on GitHub. Basically, it compiles um, you know programs from sort of higher level language and uh, it interprets it. it. It actually takes multiple um, different languages, so you can program whatever you like, um, and then it compiles down to different backends, including our own H series hardware and other people's hardware as well, um, and also a few quantum simulators on the cloud. Um, so that you don't have to keep rewriting your program for every different every single uh, quantum computer. You can write it once and then let ticket compile and optimize for whatever backend you're using. 
And so, yeah, our, our philosophy is really, you know, we're a platform agnostic. Our, our software will, will operate on different uh, hardware platforms and our hardware is uh, easily integrable to with uh, other people's software as well. Um, but in our software package, we also have a few products. Uh, one is quantum chemistry. Uh, it's a software package called Inquanto. Um, this allows chemists to uh, not have to program at the gate level, but at a much higher level and be able to do those quantum simulations. And then also um, we have a cybersecurity product that uh, generates, I use this quantum random number generator um, to produce cryptographic key, secure cryptographic keys for actual applications. Um, we also have some um, machine learning and AI uh, software. Uh, this one, uh, for example, Lambback uh, is an open source quantum natural language uh, processing toolkit. That's also available uh, on, on GitHub. And so we work with a bunch of, uh, a lot of partners in uh, academic and industrial settings um, and uh, for, for very different projects from experienced users to people who are just trying to understand, you know, companies are trying to understand um, how quantum fits in with their, their uh, business. And so um, this is our, uh, our pro product roadmap for Quantinium. Um, right now, uh, we, we launched uh, this H1 system. Our, our first, is, actually it was H0 is sort of partial H1, uh, but this H1 is all the, um, the this uh, zones in, in a linear fashion. Um, this was launched in 2020. And then that we just launched an H2, um, this racetrack uh, type of trap uh, a couple few months ago in May. Um, and then uh, we have um, plans to make these uh, more like a 2D grid, um, 2D geometry type of trap, and then scaling it up. Um, and so I, my, my role as a chief scientist uh, in technology development um, uh, is to make sure we have the uh, hardware technology needed uh, for sort of these future traps. So I work mostly on the right-hand side here. Uh, and as you can see, you know, right now we're in this NISC era, this noisy intermediate scale quantum era, which was a term coined by uh, John Preskill at Caltech. Um, and then, you know, at some point, um, we need to move to fault tolerant quantum computing, where, you know, the error rates, we need better and better error rates, and our physical qubits might not be able to support that. And so we need to learn how to do fault tolerant quantum computing. So I'll, I'll talk about it a little more um, later in the talk. Um, Dr. Dr. Lee. Yes. So in the, in the previous slide, may I ask, like, what is the difference between the, like, H3 version and H4? Like, I, I just wonder what is the role uh, of the optics here. Yeah. Yes, yes. So right now, uh, all our um, lasers are, uh, are delivered to the ion uh, through bulk optics. So these are really big, you know, lenses and, and just the standard optics, you know, think Thor Lab optics. Um, that we we built and, and we put together. Some of them are a little more sophisticated, but sort of on that level. And so even in H3, it's going to be, um, it, it's still going to be bulk optics delivery. But as we scale, um, these beam uh, delivery systems becomes enormous and, and very challenging to, to scale up to lots of different zones. And so um, we will need integrated optics, um, that, you know, where the beams are delivered onto the trap chip itself and then coming out of the trap chip and to the ion. So, so this is a more scalable version of the, you know, sort of 2D trap, but sort of we imagine the geometry may be similar. Um, we're kind of exploring other different types of geometry as well. So maybe the trap itself might not be exactly a grid, but sort of in that concept of, you know, a grid, some kind of grid-like stru structure. Um, and so uh, that's that's what I imagine the difference between H3 and H4 is really we need to put some integrated optics there. And then in H5, we may have to stitch these uh, traps together or, you know, use photonics links or, or some other thing to continue to scale. Oh, I see. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, right now um, we do have users online. Uh, you can get access to our com quantum computer with a subscription through our um, our, our portal, or you can get, uh, we have a program with Oak Ridge National Lab where uh, researchers can get access to the machines uh, for free uh, through their quantum computing user program. And that's quite popular. Um, also, you can access it through Microsoft Azure Quantum. 
Um, or if you get one of our softer packages, that also comes with some hardware access as well. And so uh, in the past year, in 2022, uh, there have been 43 papers that we could find online that has, uh, you know, all the users that are, um, are basically, uh, people have written about uh, work they've done actually accessing our uh, H1 hardware. Um, and so this is actually a really nice uh, collection of work, uh, you know, from like modeling neutrinos to you know, nuclear fission, to quantum gravity, and um, there's some uh, work on st stock portfolio optimization from JP Morgan Chase. Um, just uh, a lot of really amazing applications that uh, um, uh, that our users have been able to, to come up with. And really, our goal is to you know build the best quantum computers. You know, these are really. Um, we we are really looking at capabilities, not just qubit count. Um, so they can people can run like serious circuits and and get good results on it. Um, and, and we're continuing to push that. I think uh, this year we'll have even more um, papers coming out and some some really nice ones. And it's great to see the community engaging in that. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, switch gears here a little bit and talk about how I got into quantum. Um, I did my undergrad at uh, uh, Caltech. Um, and doing uh, things that are completely not related to quantum computing, uh, even though Caltech certainly was a great place for quantum computing. Um, at the time, I really didn't know anything about quantum computing. This is late '90s, um, you know, and uh, John Presco and and you know Alexei Kataya for are just coming up with their uh, fault tolerant quantum computing schemes. Um, and uh, but I, I, as an undergrad, I was totally ignorant of that. Um, in fact, I when I started at Caltech, I wasn't even sure I wanted to do physics. Um, I thought that was too hard. And uh, with my, um, you know, public school education, uh, that was certainly a, a pretty hard uh, a thing to scale. But uh, I had made a bet with a friend of mine um, and uh, ended up majoring in physics and, and stuck with it. Um, and, uh, but as an undergrad, I was doing nuclear research, actually nuclear physics research. And I spent a couple of summers up in, uh, at MIT Bates linear accelerator, uh, lab. I think that facility may have, uh, uh, closed down by now, but back then, um, you know, we were looking at these, um, uh, you know, electron proton scattering to, um, uh, determine sort of the, uh, contribution from the strange quark on the nuclear, on the protons magnetic form factor. Um, and so that was really cool, um, you know, nuclear physics. And uh, um, and for my, my senior thesis, I actually built some uh, equipment, uh, some detectors to qualify, you know, material um, to detect radioactivity in the CAMLAND, um, this neutrino detector um, facility. Um, so I was totally in the nuclear physics side, um, but I decided um, maybe the sort of traveling and 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 working at an accelerator and waking up at you know three o'clock in the morning to take a morning shift at accelerator experiment was a little too much, and so I converted it, decided for grad school I was going to go uh, work on some nuclear on some uh, tabletop physics, so atomic physics worked pretty well. And at the time, I, I ended up at uh, University of Michigan. Um, and uh, um, at the time, Chris Monroe also started as a professor there. And so we built our um, first ion trap experiment at Michigan. And this is my first ion trap, you can see. Um, and literally, we just took pieces of molybdenum metal, punched some holes in it, and there's my two ions. And uh, we did uh, universal quantum computing with that. So we did uh, Grover's algorithms. And this is the our, my first quantum computer. Um, and so at the time um, from PhD, you know, it was early days in qu uh, trapped on quantum computing. There were lots of different uh, uh, schemes on how you entangle. And so this geometric phase gate, um, keep coming up as a sort of something that could be more robust uh, than some of the initial Sirach-Zoller uh, gate proposals. 
And so, you know, you get paint, lots of different papers and they all say, oh, this is geometric phase gates. And, you know, you get pictures like this with energy levels. And then you get pictures like this, which is sort of some phase space diagram. And nobody could understand exactly what they're talking about. Um, and so for my thesis, um, I kind of recognized um, that well, actually, these are all pointing to the same thing. Uh, there's a, you know, you can map something like this, um, this molmer sorensen gate, which seemed pretty promising at the time, um, onto something um, that is a spin-dependent force with some conversion in your spin basis. And so once you do that conversion, then it's very easy to say, okay, you're, you know, two different spin states are walking, in, you know, and in different areas, uh, in this uh, phase space. And then, so depending on what um, how, what the area it's encircling, you get a different spin, you get a different uh, phase accumulation on your entanglement. And then, so, so, uh, so, you know, with that understanding, we could sort of unify all our um, different gate schemes and everybody can sort of uh, map onto this phase space diagram and um, then talk all, all talk the same language. And in fact, this molmer sorensen gate um, is still what we use at Quantinium, and pretty much every trapped on quantum computing company is still using uh, either molmer sorensen gate um, or, or some geometric phase gate, and including microwave gates, which is, you know, it's different frequency, but again, the spin dependent force, you can map onto the same ha James Cummings Hamiltonian with that. And so uh, in the process, I discovered that uh, this. Um, uh, you know, uh, to to depending on um, how you want to uh, uh, execute this molmer sorensen gate, you have some choices on your laser frequency, and depending on how you arrange those frequencies and which uh, direction they're coming from, uh, you could get um, in one version your uh, entangling gate has a optical phase map onto it, and in another version you get uh, the optical phase to cancel. And so, um, which is fine, you, you can choose either one, um, but you just have to make sure when you do the rest of your computation, your quantum computation, that uh, all your uh, single qubit gates and your two qubit gate are phase locked accordingly. Um, and so this is a picture, a group picture from uh, way back then, about 2005 or so. Um, you can see Chris Monroe uh, is the co-founder of IonQ, another trapped ion quantum uh, company, uh, uh, computing company. Uh, there's me uh, there uh, in my younger days. Um, and then there's uh, Win Winnie Hensinger is now at University of Sussex. And uh, he also founded Universal Quantum, another trapped ion uh, uh, company. And... Um, you know, we have uh, people from uh, like Kathy M. Soderberg and um, Dave Huckle at a Air Force Research Lab. Um, there's uh, there's Dan Stick at Sandia National Lab. Um, and then a whole bunch of people end up at professors and still quite active in trapped ion research. Um, so, um, yeah, after my um, after my after grad school, I took a detour to neutral atoms, um, and uh, I've always wanted to do Bose-Einstein condensate and and work with that. So I joined Trey Porto's group um, at NIST Gaithersburg, and um, at the time they ha will happen to have a, um, a double well optical lattice, um, and uh, so you know we can load uh, individual atoms into the optical lattice uh, with a mod insulator transition uh, from a both sides and condensate. Um, we could individually address them um, by sort of maneuvering this um, uh, optical double well optical lattice, so the left and right well has slightly different frequencies. Um, we could combine those two wells into one well, and so when the atoms um, come together and and their wave function overlaps, um, then they have the we end up with this uh, exchange interaction uh, because these atoms are bosons um, and uh, they have to follow uh, uh, symmetric uh, their wave function have to be symmetrized because they're identical art particles and then so uh, in this interaction regime you can have the um, atoms oscillate between the ground and excited state 
And so if when that happens, then if you stop at the right point, then you end up with a square root of swap because this is really a swap operation and it's coherent. And so here are some of the data showing, hey, we can map, you know, the left qubit and the right qubit to the ground and excited state of this optical lattice. And then we can map the um, map these uh, uh, optical uh, these uh, atoms um, doing a swap operation between ground and, and excited state. So this is really the first uh, demonstration of an entangling gate, a square root of the swap gate, and neutral atoms. This is the day. Uh, this is uh, before anybody demonstrated Rydberg atoms. Um, so uh, certainly Rydberg interactions are are much uh, much better suited uh, these days. Um, but that was it was kind of fun uh, demo. And then uh, my lab mate Jenny Strabley is uh, now with Quantinium as well as our um, product as our uh, director of uh, product uh, management. Um, so some old friends uh, still still working together here. Um, and then after my postdoc, I end up at Army Research Lab doing uh, quantum sensing with neutral atoms again. So we had uh, an atom chip experiment um, and uh, looking at uh, doing interferometry on the atom chip. Um, we also had a quantum network project where we um, were sending and tank. We had a dark fiber from running from Army Research Lab down the road to University of Maryland um, to their uh, AMO labs, and we were able to send some entangled photons um, down the street. And uh, Chris Chris Maro, uh, Chris but at the time um, had uh, moved over to Maryland as well, and so we really what we really wanted to do was uh, really uh, entangle our trapped ions together, but um, we did not get that far. Um, but my colleague here, uh, Kutsia Qureshi, has continued that work uh, at Army Research Lab, and, and that has been uh, quite fun. Um, and after Army Research Lab, I went to Lockheed Martin. Um, so a friend called up and said, hey, there are some interesting things, uh, interesting project at Lockheed. And so um, I, joined, uh, I joined Lockheed um, at the time. Uh, Lockheed was starting to wade into quantum computing. So here's an article. Um, from the University of Maryland on some uh, partnership, uh, this quantum engineering center between Lockheed and University of Maryland. Um, and that was kind of a precursor to IonQ, um, having trapped ions being built, uh, going uh, commercial. Um, and so I was uh, working on that project from the Lockheed side, um, as well as many other projects. And that's really where uh, I learned what it's like to be a uh, scientist in industry. Um, it's it's quite different from academia in that, um, you know, in academia, you always want to publish, you want something new. Um, in industry, there are different objectives, you know, for the business. And, um, you know, they, they couldn't care less about uh, the publication, but certainly a lot of times uh, it does involve in a lot of scientific and engineering innovation um, that you wouldn't otherwise achieve in, um, in an academic setting. So, yeah, that's where I learned, you know, how to work with, you know, teams of 100 people uh, with uh, engineers and scientists um, all trying to accomplish some goals. Um, and then around 2016, um, Honeywell started a um, their commercial effort in trapped on quantum computing um, and, and opened an office in Colorado. Um, so we're in Broomfield, is some, it's kind of halfway between Denver and Boulder. Um, and so uh, that's, that's when I joined uh, Honeywell um, and uh, evolved into Continuum. That's where we are. And so one of the things we uh, at Honeywell decided to do is this um, using this uh, quantum CCD architecture for our trapped ion quantum computer. Um, this was an idea that was uh, uh, that was first uh, conceived by Dave Wineland's group at NIST some 20 years ago, sometime in the late 90s. Um, the idea is that, you know, at the time we we're thinking, everybody's thinking these long ion chains, right, for quantum computing. And if you want more qubits, you just add more ions to the long ion chain. Um, the problem is if you imagine scaling it up, 
Um, eventually, these long ion chains get enormously long. Every ion you add to it, you end up with an additional modes of uh, oscillation that you have to control. And it becomes a little bit uh, unwieldy, right? When you get to to large number of qubits. And so the idea is, well, you just actually um, cut them up into smaller strings of ions, you know, just keep them in smaller groups. And then you can move them around on this sort of uh, device. Um, that's the QCCD part. And, you know, there are regions where you can do quantum operations and regions you can store, do uh, be stored and, um, and then you can just move them around uh, for your, your quantum computing operation. So this is our H1 um, trap. Uh, here's a picture of it. Um, this is how it only took 20 years from uh, c c the idea to actual practice of a full scale uh, QCCD quantum computer. Um, and uh, this uh, H1 system uh, right now has 20 qubits. Um, and it has five gate zones, which is, are labeled in blue, right? So these are, are different, um, these are sort of segmented electrodes that allow us to move the ions around. Um, and then there are lots of different um, Osmore storage zones in between these gate zones and also at the ends um, so that we can store extra ions and extra qubits. And so the nice thing about this is so, you know, you're, uh, you can calibrate your operations for a small number of qubits, either one qubit or two qubit operations, and you can move, uh, you know, all the ions in and out, assuming you know how to transport, and um, the operation will always be the same. So you don't have to worry about more qubits. Um, the operations will be the same, and you can keep them high fidelity without all the extra modes. Um, but you just have to figure out, you know, where to store all the other extra ions and then how to move them around. And so this is what we have for H1. Um, we used uh, ground state, uh, hyperfine levels uh, of the terbium ions, and these are uh, atomic clock states. So they're very nice uh, uh, and have long coherence times on the order of uh, seconds, several seconds. Um, and then um, because one, and then we also have these barium ions that um, we keep along with our terbium ions uh, for sympathetic cooling. Because once you put uh, quantum information, your qubit information onto in the terbium ions, uh, you can't laser cool it because the laser cooling operation would destroy it. So we laser cool the barium ions instead, and then using the Coulomb force between them to transfer all that energy. And so that allows us to do high fidelity gates you know, continuously, you know, as long as the circuit runs. Um, and then uh, in May, we, we launched this uh, racetrack um, trap, this H2 system with 32 qubits. Um, this, this has uh, eight gate zones, um, two, four on each side. Uh, currently, we're only operating on one side. Um, and you can see uh, these are 32 um, qubits running around uh, the racetrack. Um, there's still plenty of room in there um, to pack more qubits in, and we expect to have about uh, more than 50 qubits uh, by next sometime next year, and that's what we're working on right now. Um, you can look find more detail in this paper on on how this trap works, but that's the the image of the actual trap itself. So that's pretty cool. Um, so just a little bit about because uh, animation on how the tra ion trap works. So our trap actually has a hole in the middle of, in the trap itself, and um, the neutral atoms can come up through the trap, um, and um, then we shine lasers to uh, photoionize um, the trap, the atoms, neutral atoms, and to form the ions, and then the um, the potential formed by these RF. Uh, apply to these long electrodes and the DC voltages applied to these segmented electrodes uh, form a trapping potential to capture the ion when it's formed. And once we have it captured on the trap, we can move it uh, by changing these uh, uh, voltages on these uh, segmented electrodes and just move it down the line. It's kind of like a railroad track. And there it just moved into a uh, gate zone and the laser coming through uh, can you know, make a uh, pi over two rotation on it. So there's a single qubit gate um, and perform that quantum operation on it. 
And for entanglements, you need two ions. So we would have to merge uh, these two uh, ions, uh, two qubits onto a, a same potential, trapping potential. And then there, uh, there you saw the laser light coming through. That's a gate laser, which comes in from two different directions. You have to hit the ions um, and then do its entanglement operation uh, with that momer sorensen gate I, uh, I mentioned earlier. And then um, once that's done, then we can sort of pull the ions apart again and then send them onto their, uh, wherever they need to go next. And so here's an example of a, um, uh, so how, how we execute a, a small circuit here. So this is a diagram of a, a quantum circuit. Um, so we have three here, uh, we have three qubits uh, labeled in red, green, and blue. Uh, and here's an ion trap, red, green, and blue. So when we do initialization to the um, uh, zero state before we start computing, uh, those are really laser operations. Um, really, the, the trap itself is only to control the position of the ions. Um, all the quantum operations are done by lasers. And so there's an initialization pulse. And then here, according to the circuit, uh, we do want to do single qubit gate, these Hadamar gates on red and green. Again, those would be a uh, laser operation. Um, and then here in the next step in the circuits, we want to do a control knot gates between red and green. So we would have to move those two qubits together uh, into the same well first, and then turn on, once they're in the same well, then we turn on the uh, laser beams to do the, perform the two qubit entangling gate. Um, so here's the next one with the red and green, or red and blue qubits. Um, and so here we have to do this fancy swap between the red and green qubits and then move the red one over to the blue with a blue to join the blue qubit um, and then turn on the laser to do the two qubit gate. Um, in this quantum CCD um, architecture, a nice thing is that these zones are very far apart. So what we can do is we can measure a single ion without perturbing the quantum state of the other qubits. So here we measure this green qubit by turning, uh, shining some laser light on it. Um, and um, we can even record that, uh, the, um, the, uh, the measurement outcome, whether the qubit is in zero or one. And then depending on that, uh, that outcome, we can actually change our circuitry in real time um, and uh, make a, and, and perform a different, uh, diff different circuits uh, different operations on the rest of the qubit depending on the outcome of that qubit. So, um, so, so it's just to see that you know in this in this scheme, really, there's no defined neighbor, you know, in the system, right? All the all the uh, qubits are quite dynamic, um, and um, they move around all the time. And our compiler will do that. Will figure out where they need to go automatically. Um, and these operations really are characterized by zones rather than, you know, by sort of uh, a strict qubit connectivity. And um, so here are some cool uh, videos. There are two qubits here uh, brought together. And then uh, when they're merged in the same well, it's just one bright dot because the, uh, the camera can even resolve that. But we can do the split combine and the transport is uh, pretty with pretty high fidelity, with very high fidelity, you know, we run this, you know, millions of times without losing them, um, and at very low uh, emotional excitation also. And we can also do things like the swap uh, gate, uh, swap operation, just flipping the ions uh, around in terms of where they go. So really the benefit of this QCCD architecture is that now it gives us uh, uh, quite a few unique features uh, compared to other, um, quantum computers uh, that are available in the market. So first of all, this all-to-all -all connectivity, um, we can do that, accomplish that with physical, mo moving the ions uh, physically. Um, so if you compare to this to a, um, like a superconducting qubit system, where the, you know, once you lay out the device, they, there's a, a connectivity that is fixed. And so if you want to entangle two qubits that are kind of on a distant part of the, um, of your device, then um, with fixed connectivity, you will have to do a lot of swap gates to make sure to get that information right next to each other and be able to do that entanglement operation. And so those swap gates will pick up extra uh, errors in the process. 
Um, and, um, and, and so that, that's, that's a big killer, um, as opposed to, you know, QCCD, we just put, drag them together. You might ac accumulate a little bit of memory error, but that those, me the memory errors are quite small, uh, in that, uh, time of, for the physical transport compared to like two cubic gate fidelity. So, um, and, and so with this architecture really, um, right now, all the, all the quantum computers, um, it's all about high, uh, it's all about the fidelity of your operations. Um, that's limiting the performance, right? How, how large of a circuit you can run. Um, you, you can have lots of qubits, but if your fidelity is poor, you can't even entangle them all. And so what we really stress is high fidelity operations. This two qubit gate fidelity uh, right now, it's somewhere between 99.8 to 99.9%. Uh, we're constantly improving that with both hardware and software upgrades. Um, our single qubit gate fidelity uh, is above four nines. Um, and we really keep tight bounds on these as well. And so whenever we see um, these uh, operations fall out of spec, we, we uh, take the system, will go and recalibrate itself um, and return it to uh, sort of proper uh, operating uh, conditions. And so state preparation and measurement fidelity at 99.7%. Um, we have very low crosstalk error. It's almost, it's negligible. It's getting hard to measure. Um, and then um, memory error, um, because these are clock states, atomic clock states, they're, they're excellent. Um, our system, in our system, we can also have these native arbitrary angle, single qubit and two qubit gates. Um, so, um, if you are doing, if you can only do pi over two pulses, then um, sort of constructing these uh, arbitrary angle gates uh, takes a lot of gates. And so we can do this natively pretty easily with trapped ions uh, just by uh, changing our pulse duration uh, on our gates. Um, and so we can do the, so uh, the user can choose this uh, rotation angle on a single cube to single qubit gates, as well as this entangle, this angle on the entangling gate as well. Um, so that's a kind of a, the two qubit gate uh, um, really uh, makes it a lot more efficient for many of the, uh, especially variational uh, type of algorithms so that we can reduce the number of two qubit gates that's needed. And then smaller angles also get you a lower error as well. So that's nice. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, where we can do qubit re, uh, mis circuits measurement. Um, I measure our qubits, it's only some of the qubits um, in the middle of a quantum circuit. A uh, nice thing is, once you measure it, you can uh, reinitialize it and put those qubits back into computation. Um, and so, uh, using the trick, um, people have done, uh, uh, can actually. Um, run uh, some circuits that have more qubits than we have. So for example, um, we recently demonstrated a, um, a QAOA um, circuits, that's for optimization, um, that normally would have uh, taken 130 qubits. And we've managed to compile that down to you know, 30, uh, 32 qubits and run it um, on our H2 machine uh, using this uh, qubit reuse. Um, trick. And uh, right now we have actually we have a compiler on ticket uh, that'll take your circuit and try to reduce number of qubits um, uh, that that's needed. Um, and then, you know, the conditional logic uh, where we, we take the measurement outcome of the qubits in the middle of the circuit and change your um, change what uh, uh, operations you run uh, afterwards. Uh, this is absolutely necessary. Uh, for quantum error correction um, and for you know things like measurement-based quantum computing. Um, so uh, we measure our system. We like to characterize our system on a, a system-wide level, not just a single qubit gate and two qubit gate. And so we've been um, using this quantum volume metric, which was first proposed by IBM uh, a few years ago, um, to look at uh, our, our system level performance. And so the idea is um, if you have um, n qubits, um, then uh, you want to, to pass this quantum volume test. Uh, you want to do a, um, you want to do n rounds of these uh, random SU4s, right? For each pairing of the, um, of the qubits. 
And so uh, render and SU4 is uh, covers all the operations, uh, all the unitary operations that can be performed on any pair of qubits. Um, and really to do perform, you know, given a random SU4, um, you can compile that down to three. It requires three um, uh, two qubit gates um, to be able to do these um, random SU4s. And so, um, and, and so you can choose uh, the, the way this uh, quantum volume test work is that you choose random SU4s and then you try to execute them on the different pairs. And then you scramble all the partner, all the partners, right? So every pair gets uh, a different uh, pairing. And then you do another round of the same, you know, of a different set of SU4s. And so you do N rounds for N qubits. And then you look at the outcome of your circuit. And um, you look at what this was called a heavy uh, outcome of the circuit. So it's the top, most likely 50, uh, half of the outcome. And you compare the experimental outcome with the um, actual, uh, with the um, calculated outcome. And um, so your experimental outcome has to pass this two thirds bar according to their, the IBM's prescription there. And so um, here's an example from our quantum volume to the 19th run um, where you can see the average, we track the average with different um, randomized circuits and um, the average has to be above two thirds and also the error bars have to be above two thirds to pass the test. And so um, this quantum volume night two to the 19, you know, if you pass 19 by 19 on the, um, on, you know, 19 deep versus uh, plus 19 cube with 19 qubits, then you pass the quantum volume test. And so this two to 19 is quantum volume about half a million. Uh, these circuits, random circuits are pretty hard. They require on average, you know, more than 400 parametrized, you know, these arbitrary angle uh, two qubit gates per circuit, right? Um, and then you need twice as many single two qubit, uh, single qubit gates in between. Um, so this is a this is a big, big these are big circuits. Um, and uh, so we we've been, but we were able to uh, to to achieve that um, and measure that on H one one system. Um, but our H one our H one two and H two systems are are pretty much on the same performance. We just haven't gotten around to measuring them. Um, and so uh, we've been tracking this uh, quantum volume uh, since we first launched our first quantum computer back in 2020, and we've been increasing that quantum volume uh, by about 10 times a year. Um, this is an improvement in both the number of qubits as well as fidelity of our two qubit gate operations, all of our, our operations. And compared to like the next uh, best results that anybody has posted, I think the next best results was uh, quantum volume 512. Um, so we're about three orders of magnitude uh, larger in terms of quantum volume. Um, and that really speaks to uh, how well our system runs. Um, all the data and the circuits we run are posted on GitHub. You can look it up and, and try it out yourself if you like um, and, and see um, what that looks like. Um, so, you know, what does it look like when to access one of these uh, quantum computers? Um, you can download your uh, our API onto your uh, computer. Um, it talks to our cloud portal. Um, and then, you know, you can upload your, you can do your programming. Uh, you can run it through, you know, tickets or Qiskit compiler um, and optimize it. Um, but send us the program afterwards, and then they, um, and then once we see the program, when the hardware is ready, we execute um, on that. And so uh, here's an example, you know, of a very simple Hadamard gates um, uh, circuit. Um, we use this open chasm uh, that stands for quantum assembly language. Um, this is what IBM uses. So. Uh, we use an extended version of it because we have a few, you know, extra um, uh, features like that conditional logic and this circuit measurement um, and, and qubit reset um, that are a little bit unique. So it's an extended version of that. Um, but this is this will be the code you send us. And then um, it, our compiler will translate it down to kind of a machine code that says, you know, where the qubits, where the ions need to go and what operations uh, needs to be done and in what sequence. 
um, and then it gets executed on the hardware. And once the, the and then the results gets returned to the user through the portal. Um, so um, so earlier on the roadmap, I showed that you know we need to I said we need to get to fault tolerant quantum computing um, uh, going forward. And so this is uh, we've done a bunch of work on quantum error correction. And so I'll, I'll show you some of the the things um, uh, that uh, we've done. Um, so here's an example of a um, doing a repeated quantum error correction on a logical qubit. Um, the way quantum error correction works is that you can take a group of physical qubits and to a, and uh, you encode one logical qubit using the group of physical qubits. And so there are protocols, you know, uh, codes, right? Quantum error correction code schemes that uh, describe how you can do the, uh, these kind of uh, encoding. Um, so here's an experiment that we did uh, using in color code, um, which has uh, uh, seven data qubits and three ancilla qubits. Um, so 10 qubits to encode one logical qubit. Um, and so we show that we can encode, we can initialize a logical qubit. We can do a single qubit gate, uh, basically rotate that single qubit and anywhere on the block sphere. And then we can do these repeated uh, quantum error correction cycles where we use those ancilla qubits um, to check and see if all the if there an error has occurred on those data qubits. Um, and, um, and, and this one has sort of two rounds of what's called syndrome extraction, basically checking if there are errors that's happened to your qubits. And if there are, um, then um, you can, depending on what you how, what you measure from the syndrome extraction, you can tell where the error occurs and then what operations you need to apply to those physical qubits to get you back to your logical qubit, right? So, um, so we managed to do multiple rounds of quantum error correction. Um, and then we just kind of keep track of all the errors that's happened. And then at the end, before we measure a logical qubit, we can actually apply the correction to the logical qubit. That's probably the hardest part um, because that requires real time, sort of figuring out where the um, error happened and then actually applying those pulses. Um, and then you measure out or read out your logical qubit. And so here's a uh, sort of data on, on what that logical qubits uh, look like. So we did up to six rounds of syndrome extraction on different, um, you know, on, on different states on the X, Y, and Z bases. Um, and uh, this experiment was, uh, was, was uh, from a few, a couple of years ago. So at the time it's, um, we're actually adding more error uh, during our QEC cycle. Um, and it was about, came out to about a couple percent error um, every time we try to do a round of syndrome extraction and figuring out if an error occurred. But what allowed us to figure out what the error sources are um, from our um, emulator uh, to model the, the, the noise sources so that we understand. And, and today, the, the error would be much better um, now. So after doing that syndrome, uh, you know, repeated rounds of uh, error correction, uh, even though we didn't break even, um, but we can show we show that we can actually do those operations. Um, then we look at um, doing logical qubit, uh, qubit operations. So here we're trying to demonstrate a CNOT gate on two logical qubits using that um, color code encoding. Um, and so here are a couple of fun results. One is that when we do the uh, state preparation and measurement on the logical qubit in a fault tolerant way, we actually get much better results than our physical qubit. So it's almost an order of magnitude better. Um, in, in the state preparation and measurement. And then on our C naught gate, um, compared to our physical qubit, the logical qubit C naught gate is uh, just a hair a little bit be uh, better um, than our physical um, C naught gate. So this is the first time, you know, anybody has uh, uh, demonstrated, you know, actual improvement using logical qubit um, to perform quantum operations. Um, and so in that process of, of to trying to do fault tolerant quantum computing, um, we realized that you know, our, um, our conditional logic in our system, uh, which before was just a bunch of if statements, uh, was actually not enough, right? Because 
to be able to do these quantum error correction is that you need very sophisticated decoder algorithms, and it takes a lot of classical computing power. Um, and even though our, our qubits are great and they have really long coherence times, we can't sit there forever. And, and, and you know, and then and, and it's just really hard to program with if statements. So we actually developed this uh, hybrid computing uh, uh, process uh, system where we put a CPU right in in the middle of our control system so that uh, the user can program this uh, CPU with a classical decoder. So telling it, okay, depending on uh, what results you're, you you get from the measurement, um, you can, you know, this is how you compute uh, what process, uh, what, what, what uh, information, you know, what uh, correction pulses you need. Um, and then, um, so in the middle of GAR, and then the, so the user can send in the quantum decoder, the classical decoder, as well as the quantum programming um, to our system. And in the middle of that quantum computation, that uh, like a quantum error correction uh, cycle, you can call on the classical computer to do this very complicated, so very sophisticated uh, decoding uh, um, function and then get back the answer in the middle of that. And that allow us to do a lot of, uh, you know, both the, the control not gates before um, I showed you earlier, um, as well as some more, more advanced um, quantum computation. So here's, here's one that um, was uh, that uh, experiment we did on H2 recently on the repetition code. Um, the repetition code is not quite an error correction code, a quantum error correction code, because um, it only corrects either bit flip or phase flip, but not both. And for a quantum error, a full quantum error, full tolerant quantum error correction, you need both. Um, but this rep repetition code sort of utilizes all the things, um, all the mechanisms you need uh, for uh, quantum error correction. So this is why we we use that to test run our our system. And so here we're able to uh, encode a distance thirty one um, repetition code on our H0, H2 system. And you can see that the um, logical state fidelity actually did get better um, as the distance grows. And we were able to do this uh, all this encoding in real time as well with this minimum weight perfect matching, which is one of the um, uh, more complicated ca calculations um, that we wouldn't be able to do uh, with just if statements. So um, here are a few more examples. Um, and the sort of uh, fault doing uh, quantum computation fault tolerantly. Um, here's a uh, really in this early stages, we don't have enough qubits to do a full quantum error correction. Um, uh, you know, uh, for for many of the algorithms, but what we can do is do quantum error detection with a smaller distance code. So here's a paper from our colleagues in the UK where they use this iceberg code, um, which is an error detection code. Um, and was able to measure quantum volume in, in using logical qubits of two to the eight. Um, and here's another one that came out uh, just uh, uh, a couple months ago um, on actually um, running a quantum phase estimation algorithm, again, using this uh, uh, 422 um, uh, code um, on uh, using uh, quantum error detection. So that's kind of the progress towards quantum computing. Uh, twelve tolerant quantum computing, definitely a lot of work to be done still. Um, and uh, it's very exciting time, both improvement in hardware and um, and software. Um, and I'm I'll just uh, show a few more things on sort of what we've done in terms of our roadmap. Um, here's a um, demonstration of our um, junction transport. Um, uh, where this is a actually a terbium and a barium ion going through a junction trap that's like this. There are two junctions on there. Um, and uh, we're able to control these ions going in and out of the junction and whichever direction they go in and out of. Um, this has been, uh, people have been trying to do this for almost a decade, and uh, we were um, able to successfully demonstrate that. Um, and then more recently, we built this uh, junction trap with lots of different junctions. And here's an ion going around these junctions uh, in a figure eight. Um, and so this is uh, kind of fun. And it really uh, reminds me of uh, uh, kind of a Pac-Man 
uh, kind of game, right? Where we're tra trying to chase the ions and figure out where they go. Um, um, and then a few more things on this sort of technology roadmap. Um, like I mentioned earlier, where we're trying to pack these bulk optics. Um, and you can see, you know, we need pretty much all the colors of the rainbow going into UV and IR to, um, to uh, control these um, uh, trapped ion systems. And we we're trying to pack it down to these uh, small, uh, more scalable photonic integrated circuits um, with connections right onto the trap, um, and as well as uh, other active uh, components off the trap. Um, and so uh, certainly, you know, in the literature, um, MIT Lincoln Lab has been doing a lot of this pioneering work, uh, as well as ETH and um, uh, Sandia and Cornell. I won't go through all of that, but I just want to show you a few more pretty pictures of uh, some of our integrated circuits. Um, and again, these are uh, early development stages, um, but uh, hopefully we, they will be ready for commercial use in the future. Uh, so that's all I have. Um, you know, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I know that's a whirlwind tour of trapped ion quantum computing. Um, you can find out more information about uh, our systems and trapped ion uh, quantum computers in general on our website. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully um, this uh, uh, hopefully this has inspired you to um, go and try and use a quantum computer as well as uh, trying to help us figure out how to build better ones. Thank you. Oh, uh, yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for a really inspiring talk. And we would like to open up the Q&A session. So if you have any question, then please raise your hand. And we will call on you on the Zoom participant sidebar. So yeah. So yeah, while people are coming up with a question, I actually have like one question that is like, mm -hmm. um, like related to your career. So I was wondering, like, like you have like a career in like very different like um, research, very different type of the research institutes, like military like research institute, as well as the more like industrial, like quantum computing institute and also the academia. So I was wondering like, when you pass through the, this type of the different, like varying environment, did your like research focus like change? And like, was it like depending on the environment or more on your own like um, research motivation has been changed? Yeah, just out of curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's one of the things, sort of uh, stepping out of academia. I recognize that, um, you know, these different uh, institutions have um, the research program with different goals in mind, right? In the military, it really is about, you know, how do we help the warfighter, right? So quantum sensing makes sense. That is something that. Um, you know, if it works, it really helps, right? Atomic clocks, you know, uh, along those lines, um, those are the things that could, you know, if the, if it works out, right, when we can actually build products, um, it really, it really will help protect our troops and, and help, um, help our, our military capabilities. And that's what was focused on, right? So, so the quantum sensing makes a lot of sense, um, for, for in that setting, um, and that is a, one of their priorities. Um, in the commercial setting, it's a little different depending on which uh, organization. They may have different um, objectives. And so for Honeywell, um, really it is something that um, I think if we have a quantum computer, it would help Honeywell, right? So Honeywell in terms of all, um, all their chemical production, right? They're always researching new chemicals and new, um, maybe new um, enzymes or new new processes, right? To more efficiently um, produce chemicals, um, save our energy. Um, and also for a lot of the process for optimization, right? So um, Honeywell also makes a lot of control systems and if we can optimize it better, um, that could be um, helpful. But it's also, um, it's also a little bit of a fluke that uh, Honeywell got into this business um, because um, uh, that we really um, were, uh, came from a legacy of some of the, both the control systems uh, where Honeywell can build these control systems that allow us to really control the ions better, um, but also um, uh, building the, having the fat facility, the foundry to build these, um, these traps, ion traps, which is also very hard to do. So, um, so, so there's a little bit of luck there. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, I don't think I always have like 
a mission of like, this is what I have to do. Um, it's more like, well, if there's a, uh, an organization has an objective and I have the skills to apply to it to help them accomplish those objectives, I'm happy to help. Right. And, and those are our important, you know, those goals, as long as we're well aligned in terms of what we want to achieve. Um, and I'm happy to, to, um, to, to work towards that. And so um, this happens to fit in quite well. I'm very lucky in that respect. I see. I see. I actually have another question, but like, let me check whether. Okay. So yeah. So I have a like a, another question on more physics side. So mm -hmm. like, like from your talk, I really learned that the 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 like there are many like many powers of the trapped ion computer. But I think the really powerful thing is that the mid circuit measurement is really like native in this in this like trapped ion setting. So I think. Like this is really remarkable to me because like I'm more used to the like Wittberg atomary setup, for example. And then like mm -hmm. in this in this setting, like mid-circuit measurement is kind of very like a big challenge in some sense. So I was wondering, like on the other hand, in the trapped ion setting, like what is the kind of like biggest challenge that is like kind of native in the other other quantum sorry, other quantum computer platform, but at least not native in the like um, trapped ion settings. I just wondered about the vice versa point. Yeah, yeah. so I think that the biggest, the challenges are, um, one is just uh, trapped ions are slow, right? So all the time scales um, are, uh, the, the gate times are tens of microseconds. The um, transport times, uh, depending on how big the trap is, could go into milliseconds, right? Um, so, uh, like on H2 currently, it's probably like if you really have a really hard sorting uh, on the, the ions for, you know, if you're going from 30 to 50 qubits, uh, that could be tens of milliseconds, right, for sorting time. Certainly, we're improving our transport operations, so those times will come down. And the other thing is that really the long coherence time, as long as you are, are patient enough to wait for it, you know, it's not losing the quantum memory, but it is slow. Right. And there's and, and so we so going into a 2D geometry should help. Um, the other thing is that once you do a fault tolerant quantum computing, right, with logical qubits, um, then uh, the it becomes a little bit more. Um, uh, then there's a lot more trade off in that higher fidelity means that you need fewer qubits and fewer operations. To, for, to get to the same level of error rates for your logical qubit, right? So, you know, trapped ions, even though we're slow, but we might not need as many qubit, physical qubits, and uh, we don't need as many uh, operations to form a, log a logical qubit, and we might be able to still win because we don't have to do all these swap gates and, and all these things as the system grow, right? So I think, um, it's hard to say that one thing is 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 worse than another, right? So these these um, you know time scales maybe is not great for trapped ions, but you know the high fidelity gets us some benefit. So we'll see how it turns out at the end. The other thing is very interesting in, in fault tolerant quantum computing is that um, the decoder time, the classical compute time, actually takes a long time. Right. It could be microseconds or milliseconds. And even if you can do these operations fast, you may have to sit there and wait for the classical decoding to happen. And it could take that could take a long time and you have to have the coherence time. And maybe at the end of the day, it won't matter if everybody's just waiting for the decoder to work, right, to, to come back with the right answer. And so um, so. Yeah, so so I would say, yeah, a lot of the criticisms on, on trapped ions is just that it's so slow because if you just look at a strict number for, you know, operation time, um, it is orders of magnitude slower than like, you know, uh, than say um, superconducting qubits. But um, I think if you're thinking about it as a whole system and operating in fault tolerant regime, uh, then I think the jury's still out on that. And then the other thing is, it is a, you know, those traps are not easy to make. <laughs> um, and making them, and, and getting them larger and larger um, can be quite challenging. Um, and so we've been working on a lot of these um, issues. So for example, on the H2 system and with a racetrack, a lot of those electrodes are actually tied together. 
we were able to run those ions around, even though, you know, we, we, we don't need like a control signal for every single electrode, right? And so we're looking at operations of, you know, if we're going to scale up to, you know, hundreds or thousands of qubits, right? How do we manage all those electrodes on the big device? And we found that, yes, we can tie these electrodes together and still operate them. Uh, operate with them. And so that reduces the, the cost of control. Um, but I would say trap application is still hard. Um, there are lots of issues that we have to work through. Um, but I think um, uh, th those are the big challenges that, uh, um, but but it's it's nothing is seem simple for, for anybody, right? Any, any system. So Oh yeah, thank you so much. I think like that that really makes sense that like um like compared to the coherence time, we will always have to like discuss the yeah, the, the, the operation time and all this stuff. So yeah, mm -hmm. thank you so much. I see, I see. And I think um yeah, there's no more questions. So maybe like we can, yeah, since the time is here, like, yeah, we can uh conclude like Quan. Thank you very much. Yeah. No, oh, sorry, I did not hear. Was that a question? I did not hear that. Oh, sorry, sorry, professor. So, um, maybe maybe Quan's like audio is a little bit bad. So maybe I can I can like repeat it, repeat this question. So, like as a tradition, we we always like ask professors to provide some like words of wisdom for the young physicists. So I was wondering whether you have any like words of wisdom for the young like aspiring physicist. Um, yeah, I just want to say that um, you know quantum computing is a very exciting field. You know, when when I graduated from uh, school, you know, undergrad or, or grad school, um, there was no, there were no quantum computing companies, and now we employ, you know, five hundred people working towards, uh, you know, building better quantum computers, and it's it's really exciting times, and there are lots of quantum computing companies out there uh, for software and hardware, and we really need a lot of help. Um, the people to, you know, both use it, right? You use our quantum computer and let us know how it goes, right? Um, and think of new ways to use it that we didn't think of um, so that we can we can continue to improve and, and, and build you better hardware. Um, and, um, you know, we employ, um, you know, we employ people with different backgrounds, different skills. You don't even need to know quantum mechanics to work at Quantinuum. Um, you know, we have a lot of engineers and mathematicians and alongside working alongside physicists. Um, and um, you don't even need a PhD to do this. Uh, we we hire we have lab engineer um, positions and as well as quantum computing uh, computing oper computer operators um, positions that are uh, only requires a bachelor's degree. Um, we really need more people to engage and, uh, you know, to, for people to bring in new ideas. So, yeah, our, our quantum computer operators get to use the best quantum computers, you know, available. And, and um, they do a lot of important development work, right, right on the commercial systems. Um, we, we need everybody's help. And, and uh, I hope uh, you all consider uh um, engaging quantum computing in some way or another, because um, this really is a, a really exciting time and um, uh, you know perfect time to to be uh, to get involved and and uh, uh, you know sort of build the foundation of the industry. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much. And let's conclude our talk for this. And then yeah, thank you so much for uh, today's talk. And also thank you so much everyone for coming. Yes. Thank, thank you. you.